try that again. Good morning. Good morning. There we go. I know everybody's <laughs> looking now. That's a good thing. Thank you all for being here. My name is Alan Priest. I've had the honor and the privilege of being president of U.S. Chess now for the last roughly year. And uh, it's been an interesting year, uh, both on the national front and on the international front. So over the next couple of days, we will be about the business of the Federation. Um, I hope that we will take our business this seriously. This is the bylaws now, committee, right? This is not yes. your local chess club. This is not even your state association. This is the national governing body. And um, as the organization grows and as it changes, uh, frankly, the responsibilities have grown as well. That's correct. So thank you all for being able to, for being willing to commit your time and your talent and your treasure to come here and serve yeah. the, your fellow players, coaches, directors, sure parents, and the community at large. So I appreciate That's what I was all of the sacrifices that you all have made to be Gary, here. I don't know, for some of you, those are considerable. Our first order before we actually yeah, formally big, start our meeting. Okay. I would like to turn the floor over to uh, Harold Winston as a representative of the U.S. Chess Trust. Harold. Thank you, Al. You might, yeah, you might want to turn around because that's still your better side for them to see. Uh, <laughs> like to start. You have to. That's why Ken's there. He'll help. Uh, All right, the U.S. Chess Trust is a 501c3 Massachusetts trust. Our goal is to aid American chess nationwide, especially scholastic chess, and to work with U.S. chess. We donated 651 set sports and demo boards to 72 schools in 29 states. We paid the cash prizes and the first place scholarship at the Denker and the Barber events. Uh, held through the generosity of Dwayne Barber, and we give the cash prizes at the Harry uh, Girls National Tournament of Champions. And we also donated, donated 3000 to the U.S. Senior Tournament of Champions. It was a great turnout this year, a total of 184 players, 50 in the Barber, 48 in the Danker, 44 in the Senior, and 42 in the Harry. We support the scholar Scholar Chess Player Program, which gives awards of $1,500 scholarships, five, based on both chess achievement and academic achievement. And we're aided by that by the National Scholastic Chess Foundation. With the help of an anonymous gift of $5,000, we supported five women's regionals, giving them 1,000 each this year, located in the Southeast, the Northeast, the Far West, the Midwest, and the Southwest. We gave a Donnus Award to John Haskell of Florida for his many years of service in helping organize the Danger, the Barber, and the Herring, and for directing those tournaments as well. We worked with the World Chess Hall of Fame, which now has had over 100,000 visitors there in St. Louis, and hopefully many people here can visit them next year when the U.S. Open is in Missouri. So far this year, they've had over 12,000 visitors. The co-chair of the trust is Jim Ead of Northern California, who's here. Our managing director is Al Lawrence of New York. Our secretary, Myron Lieberman, who's here up front. Our treasurer, Leroy Dubeck of New Jersey. Our scholastic VP, Sunil Wiramantri of New York. Our vice president of chess and education, Tim Redman. And other trustees include Beatrice Marinello, who's here, and John D. Rockefeller of Fifth. We will accept donations in cash, checks, or credit card this year to help the meeting go more smoothly. Instead of my circulating from table to table, I will be sitting here up front, and I welcome any donors who wish to come to me. Thank you for your support. Thank you, Harold. The uh, U.S. Chess and the Chess Trust have a, an agreement as to how we will cooperate more together and have formalized that over the last few years and and this is one of the items in that agreement so i hope that you all 
we'll have the opportunity to find Harold. He's usually easy to find and, uh, and, and help out the Chess Trust. As we get ready to call the roll of the delegates, I would like to point out two things. First of all, there were five delegates who were elected yesterday at the membership meeting. They, their election does not be a, need to be approved by this body. They are delegates, so they will be announced in the roll call of delegates. I think you saw on the screen earlier that is kind of a motion. We will not be considering that as a motion, but the people are up there. So that whoever that body presented, that they are delegates now. They will be called. The other thing I would like to recognize in the audience, we had a kind of a cool little photo op yesterday. Um, we have some former presidents of the organization with us, and a couple of them have not been able to join us in the last year or two or a few more. So I would like to recognize in the delegate body today, Mr. Harold Winston, who I think was president a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> couple weeks. <laughs> it was not prior to my birth. I'm older than you think I am, unfortunately. But I do appreciate that sentiment. Uh, Steve Doyle. Thank you. <laughs> Beatrice Marinello. she here? Yeah, she's somewhere. 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 Gary Walters of Ohio. <laughs> and my good friend and colleague up here on the board, Mr. Mike Hoffbauer. Six of us got to take a picture last night that you might see at some point. So thank you. <laughs> and now, before we call the roll, we have the recognition and the sad duty to address those who have passed during this last year. Before we start with the regular roll of that, I would like to recognize another former president who unfortunately and in a very untimely manner is on this list in Ms. Ruth Heron of California. Ms. Mr. Secretary. Again, uh, um, I'm sorry if I mispronounce any names here. Uh, Jim N. Ansley, Washington, Pat Arena, Massachusetts, David M. Axon, Pennsylvania, George Babalot, California, Robert J. Bales, Jr., Illinois, Marvin R. Barker, Jr., West Virginia, Vincent J. Bazermore, Jr., of California, Peter Bergsdahl, New Jersey, Dr. Nathan Leland Bowles, Florida, Herbert J. Bergrauer, Ohio, Robert W. Burlingame, California, Edwin F. Burnett, Rhode Island, Tony Burton, California, James C. Callan, Pennsylvania, James R. Cannon of New Hampshire, Michael L. Cardinal, Illinois, Edward Carpenter, Florida, Donald Anthony Corelli, New Jersey, Chris Carson, Texas, Mike W. Chess, Georgia, Joseph Cis Cisneros, California, Brian A. Clark, New York, Donald J. Cochinor, Wisconsin, Joseph M. Coleman, Connecticut, Dr. Paul Consolver, California, Brad Cornelius, Wisconsin, John C. Doxovich, South Dakota, James P. Davis, New York, M. M. Darren, Connecticut, Harold J. Donahue, New Jersey, Murphy Y. Donan Jr., South Carolina. Danny L. Dunn, Texas. Aaron Eisenbach, Maryland. Keith D'Elia, New York. Thomas L. Evans Sr., Michigan. Richard W. Fabian, California. Joanne Favoli, New York. Jim Fisher, Utah. John J. Fitzpatrick, Pennsylvania. Solomon Francis, Pennsylvania. Walter Griesmeyer, Illinois. Craig Grigson, Missouri. James E. Gwynn, Sr., New Jersey. 
Jeffrey Hafner, California, Phil G. Haley, Ontario, Canada, Bruce S. Hall, North Carolina, Daniel Hammond, Illinois, Peter W. Hannon, District of Columbia, Ruth Inez Herring, California, Leon Harriton, New York, Billy R. Harrison, Mississippi, Robert A. Hayward, Connecticut, Raymond E. Hemstock, Maine, William T. Hendry III, Alabama, L. George Hermes, Arkansas, Douglas M. Heimbichner, California, J. Allen Henshaw, Virginia, Derwood B. Hutch, Pennsylvania, Toshia Ime, Michigan, Igor Jarowski, New Jersey, David H. Jones, Kansas, Jeffrey Mason Jones, North Carolina, Ronald J. Jones, District of Columbia, Samuel C. Jones, Maryland, Arthur C. Joy, Florida, William S. Caden, Massachusetts, Aaron Capston, Manitoba, Canada, Richard Casa, California, John D. Kelly, New York, James H. Kaiser, Nevada, Erez Klein, New York, Vincent J. Clem, New Jersey, William V. Vondrath III, California, Riley E. Lane, Georgia, Daniel N. Leeson, California, Lawrence Lerner, Washington, Sandy Lieber, Florida, Gail Lingner, Massachusetts, James P. Loring, Illinois. Richard Andrew Mahan, New York, Ralph O. McGraw, Jr., Illinois, William Bill McGreevy, Jr., New York, Brian L. Melzack, Ohio, John R. Minke, Illinois, Duane W. Mercer, Maine, Henry Duncan Mervine, California, Alan H. Messinger, Pennsylvania, Dr. George J. Meyer, Florida, Glenn R. Moeller, Pennsylvania, Rigoberto Salvatierra Morales, Florida, Roger Morin, Maine, P.J. Morris, Limerick, Ireland, John J. O'Falls, New York, Russell J. Palkendo, Pennsylvania, George H. Paxton, California, Stuart R. Pearson, Washington, Darrell L. Pelletier, Washington, Jeff Pennig, Nashville, Tennessee, Thomas Arthur Polez, Pennsylvania, Wayne W. Porter, Virginia, Edmund Jerome Powers, Illinois, Ted G. Price, California, Joseph S. Puzzuoli, Jr., Nevada, Ernst R. Rasmussen, Washington, Danielle Rice, California, John Risk, North Carolina, William Ross, Florida, William J. Ross, Pennsylvania, Ronnie D. Rubit, Texas. Leaving behind a great big pair of orange volunteer tennis shoes, Harry D. Spine, Tennessee, Antonio V. Sagasag, Jr., California, Paul J. Salem, South Dakota, Eric Allen Samuels, New York, Eric A. Schiller, California, Jeffrey Schmolt, Ohio, Jeffrey A. Scribner, Pennsylvania, Hans Sushel, Florida, Harold E. Schwartz, Jr., South Carolina, Raymond Sapira, Georgia, Ludicus, Ludis Sachs, Pennsylvania, Robert Sigmund, Pennsylvania, Dr. Graciano Sisson, New York, Ross Sprague, Ohio, Dennis Patrick Stiggerwald, New York, Gary K. Stevens, Pennsylvania, John Russell Stopa, Ohio, Pradhas Sankara, Iowa, Suhas Sankara, Iowa, Anthony Sirachi, Connecticut.
James John Tyrone, New York. Tom P. Try, Minnesota. Jean Trundell, Mississippi. Luz Del Carmen Ulig, Texas. Richard Varchetto, West Virginia. Joseph Wagner, California. Stephen Weissman, Virginia. Gerald W. Weldon, Maryland. William F. Wheeler, Massachusetts. Larry Whelan, um, Indiana. Brian Whitcomb, Whitcomb, Oklahoma. Jerry Williams, Massachusetts. Alan M. Willimont, Colorado. Martin J. Wyand, Pennsylvania. Ralph Patrick Zimmer, Maryland. Are there any others? Yes, sir. Ron Jones, District of Columbia. James Lynn, Virginia. And pardon me if you all have mentioned this last year, but George, Judge George Layton of Massachusetts. If you could uh, give me those names, I'd appreciate it so we can get it into the record officially. Seeing none others, I'd also inform you that tomorrow, basically at the close of our meeting, back in Crossville, Tennessee, at 3 o'clock will be Harry Sabine's memorial service. The U.S. Chess will be re represented at that service, unfortunately. Many of us who would like to attend are unable because we're here. But tomorrow, as the round begins, if you would remember Harry's family during this time. I'd like to observe a moment of silence for all of our members who have passed away. Thank you. Mr. Secretary, I believe it is time to call the roll of the delegates. Is Mr. Hoffman performing that duty? Yes. yes. Apparently. Yes, as chair of the uh, state <laughs> Senate delegates. Guy? Have at it. Alabama, Neil Beach. Ken Sloan? Pick up your credentials. They're fake. Frank Camerata. Arkansas, Larry Weston. What about Arizona? Maybe it's a different order, but please yell out here loudly so I can hear you out here, please. Arizona's next. Yeah. All right, nobody from Arkansas. Yes, he is. Yeah, he's, he's holding here. up his mic. Please yell out. Where? Where? Right here. Please say present so I have a oh, slight right chance. Right I don't really want to have to look over the body. I'm sorry, but you jumped in there. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Valid point. <laughs> okay. Arizona, uh, Myron Lieberman? Here. Yes. Rachel Lieberman? Here. Angelina Belikovsky. <laughs> Did I murder your name sufficiently? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle Martinez, Martha Underwood. She's here. Yep, I heard them both. Mm. 
Northern California. Tom Langland. Richard Kepke. Here. <coughs> Judith Starry. Starry. Am I murdering that sufficiently? Yeah, but she's, it's starring, but not she's here. not here. Not here. Not here. Yeah. Okay. James Eid. Notoriously present. Notoriously present. Okay. <coughs> Abel Talamantes. Here. Okay. John Donaldson. Mark Pinto. Jordan Langland, Michael Agner, Theodore Baez, another name sufficiently murdered, Southern California, Dwayne Barber, Randy Huff. Here. Sean Monros. Here. Steve Morford. Here. Jennifer Vollins. Here. James Manella. Just as he walks in the bar. Yeah. Brian Glover. Colorado. Paul Covington. What's that accounting for? <laughs> Ale Mosa, Connecticut, Fred Townsend, Alexander Lumelski, Suhas Kodali, Matthew Meredith. DC. Robin Ramson. Okay. She's here, but she's not I in here. I thought she was here. She yeah, she's not in here. Just yeah. go on. Yeah, probably late. Delaware. Uh, William Truman. Florida. John Haskell. Here. Kevin Pryor. Here. Brian Tillis. Here. William Bowman. Here. Daim Shabazz. Georgia, Fab Rogers, David Hader, Amrita Kumar, Scott Parker, Ernest Nix. Fun Fong. Here. Iowa, Eric Vigil. Here. 
Randy Bauer, present. Idaho, Adam Porth. Jeff Rowland. What happened to Hawaii? There's no delegates from there, according yeah. to this, at least. Yeah, I see that. Why? AWOL. Hmm? AWOL. AWOL. No, 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 no. Uh, Harold Winston, who on, hard to miss. Check those credentials. <laughs> Tim Just. All the questions. <laughs> <laughs> That's somebody in line right there. <laughs> Ho hopefully at the against Mike. <laughs> Steve Plotnick. Rachel Schechter. Larry Cohen. Yo, yo. yo, yo. Kansas, Brian Yang, CJ Armenta. Kentucky, Alan Priest. Here. Another one not hard to miss. <laughs> Ryan Velez. Here. Randis Burns. <laughs> Louisiana, Lila Dakin. Massachusetts, Ken Ballou. Here. Bob Messenger. There's one from Kentucky that we missed. Her name is Joan Priest. She's supposed to be on this because she's picked up the credentials. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. We'll get back to that one. Mitri Barash. An additional one from Kentucky. Joan Priest. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Chris Kim. Present. Michael Regan. Here. John D. Rockefeller. Here. Maine. Michael Dudley. Michigan. John Whitworth. Here. Brad Rogers. Tahira Yanish. <coughs> Minnesota, Dave Coons. Here. 
Mississippi, Jeff Bur Bullington. North Carolina, Walter High. Rudy Abate. I don't think most of them are here. I know several of them, but. I know Craig's not here. Wayne Spahn. Kevin Hyde. Cayono Nugrojo. You gotta be kidding. Shan Muga. I mean, I can read it if you want. Venka Taraya Shanmuga Vadavel. There is a murdered name. Not present to chew me out? Okay. Just go on, go, go. North Dakota, Vasanta Suri. Nebraska, Venkata Kali, New Hampshire, Alex Relia, Al Terry, pick up your credentials, New Jersey. Al Spreckman. Here. Mike Summers. Here. <laughs> Steve Doyle. Objection. Steve Doyle is not yet a delegate. He will be elected here in a few minutes, but he is not yet a delegate. Okay? Hold on. We're going to get to them. He's going to be. It's me. It's still me, too. <laughs> Michael Kadorovs. You say so. New Mexico, Joey Troy. Here. Nevada, Al Losoff. Janelle Losoff. Pick up your credentials. New York. Beatrice Marinello. Bill Deutschberg, Srinivas Ampali, yeah. Sandeep Ampali, yeah. Steve Emmett, yeah. Kimberly Du. Harold Stenzel, Dan Rohde, Here. Sophia Rohde, it's Sophia Rohde. Yeah. Remember that. Thank you. 
<laughs> now Lawrence. Okay. So Neil Wiramontre. We I have seen him I too. Here. <laughs> Carol Jarecki. Harold Scott. Michael Ellenbogen. Kelly Bloomfield. <laughs> John Miller. Oklahoma. Chuck Unruh. Here. Hope so. James Gray. Charles M. Unruh. Jim Berry. Oregon. Carl Hessler. Pennsylvania, Tom Martinek. Here. Rhode Island, Frank Bogle. No, he's around. Yeah, he's here, but not in here. Apparently not. South Carolina, Dave Grimaud. Here. John McCrary. Daniel Smith, Maureen, Maureen Grimaud, yeah. Tennessee, Corey Cormick, Chris Prosser. Texas, Thomas Crane, Here. Troy Gillespie, Fred. Vish, Vish. <laughs> no. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Eddie Rios. Here. Uh, Lewis Reed. Here. Wendy Reed. Here. Texas has got a strong contingent here. Mm -hmm. Utah, David Day. Virginia. Mike Hoffpower. Here. Woody Harris. Adam Christney. Andy Rhea. Present. Anand Domal Apadi. Op Domal Apadi. Yeah. 
Is that a here? Yeah, he's here. Oh, okay. I would have thought. Christina Schweiss. Paul Sweeney. Vermont. David Carter. Parker Montgomery. Washington. Fred Kleist. Wisconsin. Mike Neatman. Here. Guy Hoffman. Here. Maybe. Sandy Hoffman. West Virginia, Lewis Sanders, Wyoming, Brian Walker. Roll is complete. Mr. Secretary. Uh, the, there have been 99 credentials picked up, so the quorum is present. I believe would you have an addition to our deceased ones. Yes, I've been asked to add one name to the passing list, and that's Peter Roberts of New York. I raised an objection during the roll call, so let's deal with that issue right now. Um, there are a number of folks who have the opportunity to become delegates. They have been elected in the past as delegates at large. Those terms, and, and though that is provided for in the bylaws, those are in your book. Those terms are for three years. They must be, re be present to be reelected at the end of those three years. So if they weren't here, they weren't reelected. And for example, Mr. Camerata is listed in your advanced agenda, but he is not eligible to be reelected because he is not here. Mr. Doyle's term has ex had expired, but since he is here, he is eligible to be elected as a delegate at large. So we are now putting into uh, a motion that Steve Doyle be elected as delegate at large. Second. All in favor. Congratulations, Mr. Doyle. <laughs> or my sympathies, it depends on how you view it. Okay, before we move to some other business, we have a couple of matters uh, I didn't, of state no one delegations on I don't know. to resolve. That may also here. affect the uh, number okay. of delegates and the delegates who are credentialed. So we have had a request for um, certifying a new state association here. from our great state of Alaska. So who has the information about Alaska? Is that is that you, Mike? No, I don't have it. <coughs> it's in their packets, right? It's yeah, I think the information is in your packets. Guy from, from the States Committee, you guys have looked at this. In the work, the committee approved the uh, application for the, uh, the uh, state charter for Alaska and the workshop approved it unanimously. The board saw no, no problems in the uh, application that had been submitted. But the admittance of the new state affiliate is in fact a PR. So I believe that the state's committee and the workshop are recommending approval of this. Are there any who wish to speak to this because this is a debatable motion? Mr. President, Sean Manross, Southern California. Uh, if I may introduce to the executive board and the delegates, Jonathan Lee Singler. He has been someone I've known for about a year now, and uh, he is an extraordinary leader of Alaska Chess. He runs, as many of us have seen, the last, uh, the last Alaska Chess, uh, sorry, the last Frontier Chess Foundation. He's worked extraordinarily hard to bring about this historic moment, and this will complete the union. I ask the delegates, may please the president, may please the parliamentarian, Mr. Blue, 
to approve this historic moment by unanimous acclamation. Are there objections? Seeing none, the application is approved. Would you like to make a comment about the great state of Alaska and your affiliate? Yes, sir. It's big. <laughs> Good morning, uh, executive board, as well as other de uh, delegates and U.S. chess members. My name is Jonathan Singler. I am here representing the Alaska Frontier Chess Foundation. Uh, in support of the application we submitted this year for the state chapter. Uh, Alaska, as you know, has had a pretty shaky past in terms of having a state chapter, and over the past three years of my, uh, living there, and with the other board members that are in that package, uh, have been working progressively both in casual chess and rated chess for the state. Um, Alaska does face very unique challenges, different than other states, such as size, as well as community differences. Uh, this past year, uh, the Last Frontier Chess Foundation worked specifically uh, with a prototype program in the city of Anchorage uh, named Alaska, the, the Alaskan uh, Cultural Charter School to provide efforts uh, connecting chess with the Alaskan Native community, which is very big and very prominent in the state. Um, so the unique facets and challenges that we've had over this past year have been successful so, so thank you for the opportunity to be here uh, and being willing to look at our application. So thank you. Jonathan, are you the delegate representing the great state of Alaska? Yes, sir. You may pick up your credentials. Thank you, sir. And I believe he is number 100. On another matter, last year there was a challenge presented to the state affiliate status of our current Connecticut state affiliate. The bylaw, the delegate saw fit to appoint a special committee to explore that question. The charge of that committee was one, to determine if the Connecticut state chapter was basically fit to remain as the Connecticut state chapter. Another rival group had submitted the, an application to become the state chapter, so they were also charged with exploring that issue. And they had a third option, which was declare the state affiliate completely vacant and we'd start over. The chair of that special committee was Mr. Losoff. Mr. Solosoff, you have the floor for your presentation. Thank you, Alan. Um, as, as it turned out, this was one of the easier committee efforts. But I do want to specifically single out committee member Bob Messenger, who attended several meetings of the um, Connecticut affiliation and prodded them to some extent to uh, get their house in order. Um, unfortunately, the president of the CSCA uh, suffered a stroke and was not able to uh, become involved any further. As a result, partially of that and partially of the more amenable meetings, the uh, uh, then acting vice president called a new meeting. They elected new officers. The group that was uh, contesting their affiliation withdrew their application. So in effect, there's no action needed uh, by the board. We did recommend, based on their meetings and their activities, that they are now behaving as a, a viable and active state affiliate and should continue uh, with no restrictions. The board member who was spearheading the effort and working with this committee was Mike Hoffbauer, so Mike. Thank you, Mr. President. I would like to, to second what Al has just mentioned, specifically with regard to the efforts of Mr. Messenger, who really went out of his way to help. Uh, Hal Spreckman, also on our board here, provided some assistance and, and attended at least one of those meetings. But most importantly, the way this was, was resolved was by the, the members and the people in Connecticut. And there could not have been a better outcome for this action to have been resolved by the people who care most about it in the state of Connecticut. So I'd like to congratulate the Connecticut people for working that out amongst themselves. And we look forward to a continuing relationship with, uh, with, the, with the state chapter in Connecticut. Thank you. Uh, go ahead. Ray, one comment. There was some discussion.
the committee and no resolution, but suggest that this body consider for the future that removing a state affiliate and adding a new one should be treated as two separate items. That uh, one should not, uh, and again, this was not unanimous among the committee, but there was a feeling that it's not necessarily appropriate for someone to apply to be a state affiliate when there already is one. And that the first action would be to uh, appeal to, the, to this body to revoke the state affiliate first. Point well taken. Uh, the committee report does not recommend any change or any action. They have reported back to the body that appointed them, which was you all, and there is no, uh, no business to conduct from that report. Mr. Barber, you have a comment? Dwayne Barber, Southern California. I'd like to mention that we have consulted with Connecticut. I am pleased that we are going to see the Scholastic Initiative that set, moved forward in a very powerful way. I'm excited that we are going to also uh, want to uh, support all the state affiliates in what we have to do in the world of Scholastic Chess. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Barton. Last year, this body adopted a conflict of interest policy. That policy was sent to all of you. It was also in your packet. You should take that seriously. If you have a potential conflict of interest, it is up to you to disclose it and then the body decides what the remedy for that is. The body might decide that there is no conflict. The body might recommend that you abstain from voting on a particular issue. One thing that did not make the agenda was the appointment of the review committee. This committee, as was outlined in last year's policy, would be appointed and would serve through to the next meeting. So we're a little behind the power curve because we didn't have the ability to appoint this group earlier. But the idea, particularly for next year, would be when you receive the conflict of interest policy, go ahead and send it in. Go ahead and send in conflicts, and then this group will be able to assess those before the meeting starts. And if there are remedies, they can talk about it in that context. Also, they'll have the ability to review those conflicts against uh, projected, if, I'm sorry, against ADMs and items that they think will be talked about in the meeting because you may have a conflict, but it may not be being addressed at all during the meeting, depending on the motions that are before it. So we need to name that committee. Um, I have four. Chairman, objection. The motion that passed last year said the committee would be named right after the parliamentarian was appointed. And we're not quite there yet. Yes, and as the chair, I'm moving it. I am taking the chair's prerogative to move it up because the next thing on the agenda is the review of those conflicts of interest. We must have the, 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 the committee in place to review that. Next year, we certainly would have it after the parliamentarian because we would have committee in place up to that point. Okay? So your objection is overruled. Are there any objections to, my, to the action of the board, of the chair? Seeing none, the four that I have recommended for this and talked to about serving on it, uh, three of them are attorneys. That would be David Day of Utah, Gary Walters of Ohio, who also was a primary author of this conflict of interest policy, and Leela DeQuinn of Louisiana, and our apolitical parliamentarian election chair, uh, Ken Ballou. Are there objections to those four? Seeing none, would that committee then please get together now and get with Jen Pearson. Jen Pearson. Oops. May need to grab Jen. She's got the list because we need to look through those before we go a whole lot further and see if there are issues that need to be addressed by the body as a whole. Mr. President, yes. may I ask that we defer that action to the certification of election results? I suggest this because I personally believe there are no possible conflicts in the motions coming up, which are adoption of the agenda, election of parliamentarian, and 
the minutes of the meeting, and then I'm also needed to present the election results. Works for me. Yeah. All right. We will put that on hold for a few minutes. We'll simply move that down. I think the motion would be to table that part of the agenda. We'll pull it off the table in just a minute. Okay. We will now address the ADM 1902, Mr. Winston. Do you want to do that before approval of the agenda? Or you miss what's been above it? Approval of the agenda is 1904. It's coming. All right. All right. I move that the minutes of the 2018 delegates meeting is available to the delegates present in Orlando, Florida be accepted. A very good job was done on those minutes. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. I move that Ken Ballou is appointed parliamentarian. Second. Anybody else really want that job? <laughs> <laughs> Seeing no objection, Ken, sorry for your luck. <laughs> the next motion is 1904, which is the move to move that the delegates approve the advanced agenda for the delegates meeting and approve the standing rules as printed in the delegates call. Mr. President, I would like to offer an amendment to the agenda to move the election of delegate appointing committees to its traditional place just before holy business. Second that. Would you like to state the rationale for your suggestion? James? Yes, the rationale for my suggestion is that this, the appointment, the election of delegate appointing committees is a must pass series of motions. And if the meeting goes late, I don't think that should be rushed through at the end. So if something is a must pass motion to me, it needs to be early in the meeting. The reason why it was placed at the spot of the agenda is really very simple. The motions that may be referred to these committees, we don't know what they are until they are. And so we don't necessarily know exactly what expertise we need on some of these committees until we know exactly what they're going to be dealing with in the next year. Is that a really big deal? Probably not. Um, also, at the end of the meeting, to, to the objection to it, at the end of the meeting, normally the things that are rushed through are not the ADMs. They're the floor motions that are made. And if we thought we were running short on time, we can always uh, move to suspend the rules and move it up. But it's up to the body. Mr. Deutsch. Teach. Uh, question. The motion reads as printed in the delegates call. I did submit an amendment uh, in course for clarification to one of the ADMs. Does that? You will present that as an amendment when that ADM is presented. Thank you. Mr. Eaton. Uh, Jimmy from Northern California. Um, I wanted to preface my comments by saying that I'm, I'm going to say something that it makes light of both Alan and myself, and I want to make clear that I, I have the utmost respect and appreciation for the uh, financial stability that's been introduced into uh, U.S. chess by Alan, Chuck, Randy, and others. And uh, so I am being lighthearted when I say that Alan frequently teases me about being out of it. Point of order, is this applicable to the motion to amend the agenda? Yes. Uh, this is a preface to make sure that I am not giving offense down. Thank you. And my concern is, is that the, just what was stated, that when we get to the end of the meeting, frequently we have fewer and fewer delegates present. And Establishing that these delegates appointed committees is very important that we, as a body, as the full body, do it. So I would encourage us to move forward. Thank you. Are there any other comments? Seeing none, all those in favor of amending the advanced agenda. Now, the motion is not particularly clear. So let me clean it up for you. To move the uh, ADM 1935, 1936, 
and then the other three which are listed after that which have no motion made for them yet from their spot on the agenda and insert them right after committee report is that what the motion actually is mr messenger yes is that clear to everyone all in favor of that motion signify by raising your credential. All opposed. The advanced agenda is amended as stated. All in, are there any speaking to the motion to approve the advanced agenda as amended? No. Mr. Hoffman, I'm sorry. Ellen, uh, I move that uh, ADM 1929 be stricken from the agenda as it is uh, a redundancy to ADM 1912. Steve, jump up now. I rule that motion out of order. You're asking for me to declare it moot. It is not moot because this motion addresses uh, addressing an issue to the delegates. The motion that's in old business talks about addressing that to the executive board. It does address the same issue, Guy, but I looked at, thank you for telling me that ahead of time. I did look at it, and I do not believe it is moot. <laughs> I move to approve the events agenda as amended. That motion is already on the table. We're looking for any other comments. Seeing none, all in favor of approving the advance agenda as amended, signify by raising your credentials. Opposed? This requires a majority to pass, and I don't think we had objections to that, so we are moving on. We will make that change in the agenda. Next is ADM 1905, Mr. Blue, certification of our election results. This should be very controversial. <laughs> Mr. President, before I present my report, I would like to take the liberty, on behalf of the election committee, to express the committee's deepest condolences to the family of Harry Sabine. Among his many other invaluable services to the Federation, he has been the chief teller for our executive board of elections for a very long time. We are grateful for his service. Mr. President, this year, there were 4,043 registered voters. Of those, there were 1,006 ballots returned. Two candidates running unopposed are, are have the majority of the votes. <laughs> those two candidates would be. Those two candidates would be Mr. Hoffpower and Mr. Unger. Who are currently board of direct who are currently members of the executive board so they have been re-elected the election results are the day of the election. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. appreciate your votes i didn't vote for you but okay. <laughs> <laughs> mike did i hope mike did i would hope so it is now time i'm sorry go ahead I was only going to point out that this would be the time for the uh, Conflict of Interest Committee to meet. Yes. And Jennifer is here. So if we could get that group together while we do the officer reports and get with Jennifer and we'll get those. If any of y'all have those that you have not turned in, now would be the last moment to get those dudes in. It is important that you do this because if you have an undisclosed conflict, and you have voted on something that presents a conflict, you put yourself at risk for failure to perform your fiduciary duty. Yes, ma'am. Alan, I would just like to say, for those that just received the packet and are writing frantically, uh, can we, do we have a little more time? Yeah, they're gonna be working on it for a while. As soon Thank as you, you get it, we're gonna be doing reports, hop up and run it over there. Try to avoid any parliamentary procedures in my issues in my absence. If no, but as long as nobody fusses at my report, we're good. <laughs> Since I'm going to be making a report, I'm actually going to turn the chair over to Mr. Hoffpower, and I'm going to move the podium.
by the way, by the way, these are directional microphones. As you can tell, if you're not right up against it, they're not going to pick you up. So take that as a warning when you come up to the things. You got to be right up and do it. I'm a singer and a performer, and an omnidirectional. You kind of can be way, or you can turn your head away from it, and you're good. A directional mic, you got to like kiss on it. So please don't do that. It'd be unsanitary, and the person behind you would be upset. But still, you got to be right in it. This microphone stand won't raise up anymore, so I'm just going to pull the mic off the stand and hold it. All right, so here we go. Carol, you may not have this problem. You're not quite as tall as I am. You know something, folks? Change is hard. Anybody know the name Edwin Demings? That name ring a bell? Yeah, he was a quality control and efficient engineer and efficiency expert. And he told Detroit, you need to change what you're doing. They didn't listen, so what did he do? He revolutionized the auto manufacturing industry in Japan. And what then happened? Detroit closed down for a while, right? Change is hard. Detroit couldn't change. Japan rebuilt in a different way and was successful. You know, the problem is we get comfortable with the way things are. And part of us longs for how things were. So that's why change, especially when U.S., so why should we change, rather? Especially when USGS is approaching record membership, has improving, and I would say, extraordinarily strong for our organization, finances, sees continued growth in scholastic chess, and experiences increasing success in international play. There was a recent article by Stephen M. R. Covey the name Covey probably sounds familiar to you. He is the son of noted author Stephen Covey. And this article was posted on the website chiefexecutive.net. The article explores the need for ever-increasing change in our fast-paced world. Covey tells of the great historian Arnold Toynbee, who studied the rise and fall of civilizations. And Toynbee concluded in the way that academics sometimes have a great way with the turn of the phrase, that nothing fails like success. Nothing fails like success. What? How is success failure? Well, Covey states, and I quote, he, Toynbee, posited that when societies face challenges, they use creativity and innovation to successfully respond. But inevitably, the nature of the challenge changes and yet they so often respond with their old approach. Their subsequent downfall is as certain as their newfound challenge. Hence the expression, nothing fails like success. Now why is this relevant to US chess? This is a guy talking about the rise and fall of the Roman Empire. Well right now I think things look pretty good. We are past the days when we are not certain of the money to pay our team members during the summer. We were dependent on a few things working right each year, and if any one of those failed, we had a big problem. Now, as I mentioned, we have success across the board. We have membership growth. We have a reservation of finances that are indicative of a series of good decisions and some good fortune. Some of those choices were made by US Chess, and some of those choices were made by our players our friends and our supporters. But we do not have the luxury to sit back and assume that what we have been doing will continue to produce the same level of results. The need to adapt is relentless. Organizations that are not agile and fast to adapt to the ever-changing and increasingly fast-paced world will fail. US chat, for US chess, failure is not an option. That sound familiar? Yeah, I stole it from the old Apollo <laughs> program. Right? Failure is not accomplishing the mission laid out to us by the delegates over 10 years ago. That shift in our mission led us to become a 501c3 tax-exempt organization 
rather than remaining a 501c4. And we have had to reassess the vision and value statements that we use to evaluate the relevance of both things we have done for years and for new ideas. Now people resist change largely because they, will fear, they fear they will lose something dear. Also, change threatens entrenched interests that benefit from the old ways of doing things and do not want to change themselves. Yet, change is inevitable. It seems that consternation and conflict over change is also inevitable. We cannot avoid that, but we must be sensitive to it, and as an organization, we must work through it together. So what have we done to change, to fulfill the mission set by you in 2008-2009? Well, great membership service is a key goal of U.S. Chess. We are modernizing our whole database structure. We need to make sure that it doesn't fail due to age, and we must take advantage of all, the technolo all that technology can offer us to provide excellent member services as we go into the future. Those of you all who have attended workshops have heard us talk about this very specific issue in multiple times. Much of the work in a volunteer-driven organization is done through committees. Mike Hoffauer ably led the effort to work with existing committees to develop charter statements for each committee so that their efforts would be fully aligned with the broader mission of U.S. Chess and to provide a sense of direction for those committee efforts. Through that process, we also assess the activity and the effectiveness of current committees and how those committees fit into the goals and the vision and the objectives of this organization, which led us to change some, to eliminate others, and to restructure certain elements of our committees very extensively. This was all done simply to position U.S. Chess for the future. During this last year, we changed certain membership policies. The EB can only adopt promotional memberships, but we added a promotional membership for prison chess, and we modernized the junior tournament player program to address more sensitively issues related to homeschools. We renewed our commitment to work with FIDE and our continental organization. Now I realize in some cases that's controversial. And believe me, having dealt with it for some time now, there are things in FIDE that really need to change. And I don't think folks would disagree with that. But we cannot make those changes standing on the outside and yelling about it. So, during this most recent General Assembly, we placed an unprecedented number of U.S. chess members in key FIDE roles, and we reached out to our America's neighbors in new ways. We are working with those who want to reform FIDE. I don't know if it's ever happened, but we got individuals elected to every elected committee and presidential board within FIDE. Quite extraordinary. We expanded our development efforts by hiring our development director, Jeff Isaac, by adopting gift acceptance policies, updating our case for support, creating a planned giving program with all the materials that you need to do that right, and expanding our contacts with potential sponsors, including many folks who have not associated with us in the past. And that effort is continuing and accelerating under the leadership of our chair of our development committee, John Rothfeld. We revised our policy to address some issues related to our membership. We revised our policy recognizing the acceptance of transgender players. We formalized and expanded our policies for the review of new electronic devices for use in chess and we adopted guidelines for safe play to place us in the forefront of child protection. As we priorit and we prioritized events to plan where to expand and if necessary to cut our support for events to those that would most closely advance our mission. 
Covey concludes that, quote, we're so deeply scripted in our old successful response that we're often afraid of disrupting ourselves, unquote. Your executive board is trying to be disruptive because we must. That is the only way we can rise to the new challenges that we face, some of which we cannot even anticipate today. So what can you do to help us? Well, we are humbled and grateful for the support that we have received over this past year, and we thank you for that already. It is a continued commitment and support of our philanthropic friends and partners that enable us to advance our mission through meaningful programs. Programs that extend the joys and benefits of chess to school children, to seniors, to at-risk youth, to prisoners, to the underserved, and to the underrepresented. These are programs that make dreams come true. These are programs that make a difference. There are now more girls playing chess in the U.S. than at any other time, and this year for the first time, because of the generosity of donors and friends at the CCSC, we are able to provide a grant program that has awarded grants of over $50,000 to external startup programs that advance girls and women in chess. These are monies that enable local programming, and as those programs develop it, we can gather the information about what has been successful and spread it to the rest of the organization. Donor funds we received this year from Mr. Barber and others also allow us to pay for scholarship donations to three invitational U.S. chess events, the U.S. Junior Championship, the U.S. Cadet Championship, and the U.S. Junior Girls Championship. We also received funding from donations for uniforms for the World Cadet, World Youth, and under 16 Olympiad delegations, allowing players to look sharp as they proudly compete and represent us and our nation in these important events. So who is it that is making all these great things possible? Is it U.S. Chess? Well, yes, but only because you are U.S. Chess. It is the generosity of people like you that is making such an impact on the game of chess and on the lives of players through the many programs that you choose to give to, whether it is the general fund, our fund for at-risk youth, international youth championships, national senior tournament, Olympiad, or other programs. Inside the new U.S. Chess Annual Report, which I didn't get up to wave it for me. Yeah, here we go. There's a stack here. If you didn't get one, get one. Inside the new U.S. Annual Report, you will find a giving card along with an envelope. Please look it over and consider one of the many ways to give. You can make a one-time gift. You can make a matching gift through your employer, a monthly gift, or a gift through your estate plan, which entitles you to become a member of the new U.S. Chess Legacy Society. Please consider becoming a financial partner with us and investing in the game that changes lives and makes dreams come true. No matter the size of your gift, know that your contribution goes a long way toward fulfilling our mission, which is empowering people, enriching lives, and enhancing our communities through chess. Thank you for the opportunity to be of service to you through this year, and we're looking forward to another year of great advancement of chess in the United States. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, sir. Is this uh, reading you just did available? Can you go to the microphone, please? I'll handle it. Okay. The question is, is this available? Well, actually, what I was reading from is a combination of stuff, which is my report in that report. And, thank you, I get to advertise this. I have a column that's in Chess Life for the president. It's called Across the Board. Over the last several months, what you have seen me doing in that column is outlining the, outlining the mission and explaining each of the five goals of our vision in detail. 
And in September, what you're going to, if you'll read it, it'll sound real familiar to you from what you heard today. Thank you. Yes, sir. Daim Shabazz, Florida. I have a question about, you mentioned prison chess, and I see in the, the proceedings that it said it has disbanded next to it. Could you please clarify that? We had a committee that was ineffective and not accomplishing anything. So rather than have a committee in name only that really wasn't doing very much, we said we're going to restructure that and figure out how to do it in a different way. Our first step toward doing that was working out this promotional membership for prison chess, which is what many of the people who are active in it ask us to be able to do first. If we have folks here who would like to revive and be active in the prison chess community and will not just be focused on their own activities in a three county area, but we'll be looking at this from a national perspective, let us know, we'd welcome your help. Thank you. Andy? Yes, Andrew Reddy from Virginia. Point of information, what is the process for informing the delegates when uh, when the people who have been absent from the roll call arrive and are present? And I, in the example I had from the District of Columbia, we have Robin Ransom here. They need to check in at the desk with Jennifer, make sure that we've got credentials. We have a quorum, so we don't necessarily need to know that they're here for the purpose of the quorum. If they'll just check in, they can get credentials and we're good to go. Because they're already listed. Our next report will be by our president. I'm sorry. That's me. <laughs> Deja vu. I was at the general I was at the General Assembly and I was in the CCA meeting and I said something about being president of the United States and all these people chuckled and I did look I don't care what your politics are I said no I'm not that guy you know if you don't like him it's not me so anyway <laughs> we'll turn the microphone over to our executive director I think our treasurer treasurer's next treasurer, treasurer. come on Chuck treasurer vice president okay. our vice president finance Ch for finance Chuck Unruh see I was focused on what I was doing pretty heavily I'll go back to being the chair of the committee. <laughs> go for it, Chuck. Well, I'm vertically challenged. I can reach the microphone. <laughs> That's as big as it gets, boss. <laughs> yeah. I think I can reach your microphone. This is great. This is great. <laughs> so, uh, first, uh, truly, am, it is a pleasure to serve as, as your Vice President of Finance, which is could be the treasurer, and and I really do appreciate all the votes. I hope that uh, ex President Hoffpower got more. He's a better candidate, but uh, we'll see. Anyway, I want to talk about change a little. I noticed that the uh, president said something about change. Well, what happens? When we have change, our finances catch up to the changes. And that's really what has been happening. We're gonna look at our audited report first. Now, we did a lot in the finance committee. We had a meeting and we had a finance workshop and we accomplished quite a bit. So we're not gonna go back through it because if just to do the audited statement with the wonderful split notes, was about an hour and 15 minutes so I'm going to give you the short version of where we are for the for the last two years and why do I say two years because we're on a two-year cycle and this year in our reports in our audited financials you'll see tournament expenses blossomed they were up 50 percent no we're running our tournaments as efficiently as possible we just had more obligations more what we call fee day events. Overall, it was a good year though. There are a lot of good things happening. We're gonna talk about the changes and how we see them starting to come through the balance sheet. So over the last two years, what we'll see is that we created a surplus. The combined surplus with both years was 779,000. That's a tremendous amount of surplus but we'll have a report from our executive director on our capital budget uh, needs, and we'll talk about that briefly. But 
the organization is very solid. We've generated the surpluses, we'll need these surpluses in the future. And when I talk about the finances, we want to say, well, how much do we generate this year? You know, when two years, 779, well, this is a tougher year. The 18, 19 year was, was more difficult because we had more obligations in our events. And we generated still $241,000 worth of surplus in this year. Now we're back on the cycle where we're going to have a little breathing room. But we're fully staffed now. Now we're fully staffed because of the expanded mission. We've added, at, added a position that was always there, but we, we finally filled it. In the past, we've been running a little bit short-staffed, and that saved a considerable about amount of funds in the last three years. So our, our staff has been almost over time in their commitment, and, and I appreciate that. Uh, what we're seeing then, are we getting results? Well, we are. We're getting very good results. Donations are up. Some of the donations are matching fund donations, so we have to have reserves to match those. Uh, we're starting to see our programs kick in, and that's very, very uh, much within our mission, our new mission going forward as we expand. But we, have, we don't want to forget that our membership is very important. That's still our largest source of revenue. In the last two years, we've collected over $4 million of membership funds. This year, membership revenues are flat. Now, now I heard that we have more members, and that's wonderful. We have more life members, people signing up for life memberships. We have more benefactor members. From the early days of the benefactor member, where there were three of us when the program started, we're now up to 46. And a benefactor member is a person that donates extra up and above life membership. Uh, I believe the minimum is a equivalent of 3,000 in value. That's exciting to me. That's a, that's a tremendous commitment by our membership to the, to the uh, mission of this, this organization. So we have growth. Well, how much growth in, in donations alone? Well, one of my reports here tells me that we're seeing 30% just by the auditors. The auditors said our donations grew by 30%. But in the last two months, I know it's much better than that. So we continue on good footing. I'm giving you a little bit of what's in our past now. May is done. The audit and financials are done. But as we move in, we're two months into the current year. And it looks great. We're doing really well. Um, going back to the audit of financials, I'm going to talk a little bit about our membership revenue. Not our memberships. Remember, we, we increased our memberships. But our revenues, um, we looked at our tournaments over the last two years. It cost us uh, to do this program about $1.6 million. That $1.6 million represents 40% of the membership monies, funds. So what are we getting when we sign up for U.S. Chess and do a membership? Well, 40% of it, it's, it's tournaments. And in those tournaments, we don't include payroll. So our, our events, in general, on a two-year cycle, are not money makers. Then, publications will be another 30 or 40 percent. When we finally add up all of our costs, the costs of running this organization are more than the membership revenues. Fortunately, we generate other sources, and that's what I was talking about, the donations. One of the other things that we're seeing finally uh, starting to flow through our audited <coughs> statement is an increase in investment income. We anticipate going into the new year that our investment income will continue to grow and grow significantly. 
in. <laughs> you have a fan. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, in, you know, we hear about what we're, uh, how we're going to do this in the future and change. Well, our, our president in March did something that caught me by surprise, as he often does. And, and uh, he proposed the endowment fund. This, that is exciting news. I don't think we've ever had an endowment fund, and we funded the endowment fund. <coughs> Along with other funds that you've heard about, our life member asset, guarantor, our guarantor trust, and that is to make, to make sure that monies are invested for the services of, uh, well, it's actually the expenses incurred to the life membership. When we get money in, well, we just don't put it in the, from life members just into the balance sheet and the P&L and it disappears. Most of it is set aside for the future. At one time, this organization had a life membership based on 20 years, actually 20 years worth of the regular membership. Today it's 30. We're living longer. So it has worked much better. The life, the life mem membership, uh, LMA, life member assets, are doing well. We should be able to meet all of our obligations. Now that's another hat I wear. I, I'm chair of the life uh, LMA grant or trust. Now that trust uh, this year did very well also. Um, are there any questions on our audited finance, finances before I go forward? Chuck, with your permission. Yes, sir. Um, I spent over an hour yesterday going over the details of the audited statement. I will not bore you with that today because I know many of you are not CPAs and get kind of excited with stuff like that. It's, you know, a character flaw for us. Um, but I do want you to note that there is a, a marked change in the reporting standards for nonprofits. It's effective now. So these financial statements reflect that reporting change. Also, the numbers from last year have been restated, not to make any changes to the bottom line, but to make the numbers comparable from one year to the next. So where we had to report something a little bit differently, those numbers are reflected the same way in the two years. One of the major changes is that restricted funds in the past only reflected donor restrictions. Now restricted funds represent um, board restrictions as well. So if you look on the balance sheet, you will see uh, that there are donor restricted funds in there. If you look in footnotes, if you're ever reading financial statements, the CPA says, but look at the footnotes, they tell you a whole lot of information. In the footnotes, there is a description of each of those restricted funds and its purpose and the amounts related to it. Finally, as Chuck teed it up for you for the next part, boss, as we talk about what the budget coming up is, this year there is a subsequent events footnote in there. Subsequent events footnotes are for things that happen that are significant that we think as the authors of the financial statements, it's the organization, that our readers of them need to know to fully understand what's going on. And in this subsequent events footnote, we talk about the um, contract that was issued for this IT project you've heard us talk about. We talk about the phase two portion and we are telling you that we have a lot of money, things look good, but a lot of it is spoken for, okay? The other thing, which is not quite as reflected, in, it is reflected in the financial statements, but we did not talk about it much yesterday, is at May 31 this year, because of the timing of V-Day events, we had collected roughly a quarter of a million dollars that was about to leave us. <coughs> so the cash balance is a quarter million dollars higher for payments that had been submitted by players and their families for participation in the North American Youth and in the beginning for the World Youth and Cadet. So, so 
of that cash balance, quarter million dollars went away within six weeks. But that was totally planned and expected. It's actually down in there as a liability as well. But if you just look at cash, adjust for some of those things. Finally, the other note which is important in there is there is a liquidity note. And that is a new disclosure that talks about when we look at cash, we take out things that are restricted, we take about things that are spoken for, what could turn into money we use to pay bills over the next year? That number at the bottom of that footnote, look at all the cash and all the assets, that number is 1.2 million. Okay, so that, that's the amount, and we're gonna spend 500 to 600,000 of that on phase one of the IT project. If you ask why we've been holding on to money, I mean, we budgeted a quarter million dollars for the IT project for two or three years. We didn't spend it, we put it in the bank. So we have it available to do this when we got to it. Okay, Chuck, I've teed it up for you. I'll hand it back. Okay, I, I appreciate that. In fact, one of the things that was created as part of our change over the, the past three or four years was the reserve fund. And as you know, our reserve fund started out at 800,000. We added a couple hundred thousand recently. And now the reserve fund, as of this morning, has hit a new record. We are investing that fund. It's at $1,341,000. I'll make a footnote to most of our investing. And our investing is predicated mostly in bond substitutes. Now, what the, so we're getting quite a few cash dividends. We're, we're in the cash deposit market with banks. And in one of the footnotes I saw on the, the report that we just heard about, it, it, it stated that uh, perhaps we're not, not protecting our money. Well, our money is protected in sweep programs. So the auditor statement, and I don't know which page that was on, uh, he obviously didn't know that we are in over 10 banks that gives us 2.5 million worth of protection from the federal government. So we're very, very conscious of our risk profile as we go forward. Our basic risk in investing would be dramatically or extremely rising interest rates. And if you have followed interest rates from December on the US 10-year treasury, from tr December of 2018 <coughs> to today, it's fallen about 50%. We started at 3.2 in December, percent yield. We're at 1.7 this morning. Interest rates are falling dramatically. This is like being in your canoe on a swift river. So that really works. You don't have to paddle as much, but there will be a day when this turns on us and we'll be prepared. Uh, going on to our budget, there are budgets up here. If you do not have a copy, we have extra copies. Our budget this year has a few changes, but they're nothing out of the ordinary on the regular operational budget. The operational budget calls for an increase in membership. Actually, last year our cash, cash memberships went up, but some of our sustaining and deferred membership money didn't decrease, and so it looks like membership stayed the same, but cash-wise, we actually gained 4% year over year, but when you start adding deferred income from the memberships, it looks flat, where we uh, only gained 0.74%. This year, we're, we've increased membership revenues by another $20,000 in the budget. We think we can make that. We think that uh, the increase in several of our events and the increased participation will do well. Uh, that's a modest increase, $20,000 on $2,030,000. Other places in the budget as you move through it that have changed will be pay payroll. Our payroll, of course, last year, we weren't fully staffed. This year, we're fully staffed going forward. We also increased some of our thoughts on donations and interest coming off of our investments. 
our investment interest this year will top fifty thousand dollars that's just straight cash off the investments tournament expenditures will be down we're in that part of the cycle which is favorable to us on tournament expenses of course revenues will be down we're, we don't have the big P day events all in all as we get to the bottom and this is a very conservative budget we're going to see a hundred and twelve thousand dollars surplus so once again if everything goes right and there are underlying risk anytime you're you're changing rapidly and you have so many moving parts there's a risk but that risk we think we have set aside by being a little bit conservative in our budget or very much in some cases that we'll be prepared for it now I'm I will make a motion at this time to approve the budget after discussion ADM 1906 now then becomes on the floor the executive board actually has made the motion to approve the budget as presented Mr. Bauer thank you Randy Bauer from the state of Iowa I want to make um, one follow-up comment as it relates to the budget now many of you who have been involved in this process for a long time know that we have continually worked to provide more information within the budget so we break out tournament revenue and other sources that in, in past years have not necessarily um, been reflected that way. One of the things that has been mentioned here that I'm hopeful will continue to build on the budgeting process is the capital budget. And um, in the instances where you have expenditures for um, projects that are often multi-year in nature and where the asset is going to um, be substantial for a number of years, developing a capital budget is generally considered to be a budgeting best practice. And I believe that we will continue to operate and start building that out more so that we can, as a body, understand that some of these surpluses were not just being parked for um, no discernible purpose, but it was to build up the resources necessary to make major capital um, investment and, and the expenditures associated with that. So in future years, I have suggested and I'm hopeful that we as a board will actually build out a separate capital budget so that that is another kind of level of transparency as to what the purpose is for you know, resources that are being gathered together. In general, though, I, um, I commend Chuck and those who have worked on the budget. I, I do think it is um, a good budget. One of the things that started many years ago, and I was involved in the process, was to really start being realistic in what we were believing we were going to have in terms of revenues. There were um, some budgets, I think, in years where um, the revenue numbers weren't necessarily as realistic as what we're presenting now. So I'm completely supportive of the budget and hope that uh, we as delegates will pass it. If that becomes a common problem. Churches are notorious for it. You know, they come up with all this mission they want to do and they just figure God will provide the money. And, and God can, but the people got to write the check. One thing about the budget document in front of you that probably is not particularly clear and Chuck didn't address it, and we hopefully did not provide a key for you. But on the right hand side of the document, there's things like ones and B's and A's. When we worked on this budget, what we did is we took a look at the numbers and said what parts of our mission to which parts of our mission does it align so if, if the keys for the one through five are simply go look at one of my columns over the last five months and i list five objectives they're in order they're not in order of priority but if you the first one there would be the number one is that this associates with that so so if if you do that and and then you get a little better feel for it some of the others are a little bit less clear but we can help you follow through that if you'd like to later on is there any further i'm sorry okay is there any further discussion of the budget seeing none all in favor of approving the budget as presented signify by holding up your credentials all opposed the budget is passed 
I believe that now we it looks like our conflict of interest committee is back in the room. Can we have a, is there a report that needs to be presented? There may not be. I'm just offering you all the opportunity if you need to make a report. We have five members need to be thrown out of the room. Mr. President, no report is needed at this time. Thank you. Well, we've had a lovely time for the last couple of hours, but if you're like me, before we get into Carol Meyer's report, I'd love for us to be able to devote our full attention to that. So let's take a 10 minute recess. I'll see you back here at 11.05. Thank you. I'm sorry? Yes, the budget was approved. Thank you all very much. I'd like to recognize, I think we've had another few delegates come into the room since we called the roll. I'm going to miss some, I know, but I see that Al Lawrence has come in from New York, Tony Rich from Missouri is now here. There may be a few others. If you have come in and you have not gotten your credentials, please make sure you go over to the table. Jennifer's not there right now. Yeah, Jennifer's standing up, wave in the white jacket, and she will get you taken care of if you're on the list. We've already established we have a quorum, but we do want you to make sure you have the proper materials. Um, we have about 50 minutes before we need to recess for the awards luncheon. So we will cover as much ground as we can until then. Um, do I anticipate we will get all the reports done? It just depends on how long-winded we all are. We Next not, up. He's not giving any more, so. Our esteemed, and I mean that sincerely, Executive Director, Carol Meyer. Nice welcome. It's been tremendously gratifying to mix with everybody over the past few days. Um, I can't believe how many faces are already familiar to me. This is my only, only my second delegates meeting. As I did last year, I wanted to start out by expressing my appreciation for so many who have helped me settle into this role and who are such big contributors to the mission and the, the work of U.S. Chess starting with the executive board, all the guys up here to my left put in a lot of time on behalf of this organization. I don't know that if you've never done it, you have any idea of the hours of investment every week most of these folks put in. It's, it's two, two to 10, I would venture a guess. And without their leadership, we wouldn't be where we are today. So thank you. I had an opportunity to recognize our staff yesterday, but I, I would be remiss if I didn't do it again today. We have a great team. Down to a person, they are always willing to step up and take on things that are not in their job description. Um, we couldn't get it done otherwise, so a big shout out to the U.S. Chess staff. To those of you who are sitting here as delegates and to everyone else who serves on, on committees, again, the volunteer contributions, the guidance, and in, in some cases, the, the work that you do on our behalf to carry out our mission is so important to our success. So thank you to each and every one of you for your commitment to us and for making things happen on the ground. And I'm, I'm looking at a couple of people here, you know, Maureen, Grimaud, and Janelle must have stepped out. Um, there are many others who are just making stuff happen and um, making us look really good because of their activities. So thank you. <laughs> to, to our donors who, who are making it possible to grow our program offerings, thank you. Um, we can't say enough. We, we hope we've honored you appropriately in this year's annual report. And of course, to our members who, <coughs> without you, our reason for existence would not be here, so I want to just say thank you. On the um, sponsorship front, Alan and others have already spoken a lot about our sponsors. 
This is an area that's sort of new for us. Um, we are very actively working to talk to corporate entities, um, both those who we've traditionally worked with and, and, and new folks. So um, the St. Louis Chess Club, thank you, Tony. Um, the Kaspar Chess Foundation, Michael, thank you. Um, Susquehanna International Group, one of our new sponsors. The Barber Fund, Dwayne, thank you. Um, American Culture, Intercultural Education was our sponsor for the um, international youth teams this year. Um, new sponsor, Two Sigma, was our sponsor last year. U.S. Chess Federation Sales, Sean and his team. Um, Trophies Plus, and of course the U.S. Chess Trust who has sponsored many of our activities, especially in the scholastic arena. So thank you to all. So I, I was playing with a couple of ideas of how to sort of get the point home that this organization is changing. I think Alan did a wonderful job of sort of casting the net far and wide, um, describing all the different things that, that are going on. But I think my job has perhaps changed the most. And Al, you know you're an executive director. I suspect I, I tackle the job differently than, than you did. So I wanted to give you a, a quick overview of how I, th I think of myself in this role. I'm, a, I'm an ambassador. Um, I'm a, an advisor, a staff, a staff leader. That's a call from Boyd at about 10 o'clock at night. Um, <laughs> you know, a Sisyphus impersonator. Um, a referee, and I'll leave that there. Um, a salesperson and a cheerleader. Um, I'm at my happiest when I'm at an event rooting on the players, no matter their age. Um, that's what makes this job really, really fun. So to, to kind of move to the business side of this, um, internal operations, we've had a great year. Lots of moving parts, lots of changes afoot. The most um, notable change in our staff profile this year was the addition of Jeff Isaac and the creation of our um, de development department, fundraising, for those who aren't familiar with the term. Um, Jeff has done a great job laying the groundwork for our program. We are doing a lot of planning. We're developing the materials that are needed to reach out to different people and, and organizations. So um, Jeff couldn't be here today, but you know I'm, I'm grateful to the expertise that he's brought to our organization. We've also had some shifts. We, um, you probably remember moving. We had we moved Dan Lucas into a new role last year, having been our longtime Chess Life editor. And Dan is now in charge of all of our communications. We've we've done a, a I think a really great job of expanding how we communicate. And Dan is in charge of overseeing a pretty good chunk of our staff who are involved in different uh, modalities of communication. And then we also moved Jen Shahadi, who had been in our communications team. She still has a little bit of a role um, working on our website, but because of the changing nature of our organization, we've moved her into a program position, and she is our director of women's program. So the, the staff pot profile is definitely related to us developing programs and launching new initiatives, and you know, all of these things are, are very nicely knitted together, I think. Um, we, we continue to update the way our office tackles their work. Um, you, many of you know that we have several very long time employees. We have somebody who, who is celebrating her 50th anniversary with the Federation this year, and her twin sister is coming up on 49 years. A lot has changed during their tenure, um, but God love Judy and, and, and Joan. They, they are um, sort of the, 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 the glue that holds so much of this together. And if you need a question answered about something historical, they're our go-to ladies. Um, but change is not their strong suit. And, um, but they're always willing to learn and listen. And, and um, they're, kind, they're, they're coming along for the ride, I'm proud to say. And then, of course, this has been talked about throughout the week, our infrastructure refresh. This is a project that is massive um, for us. We have a small staff and limited expertise in the IT space, so we've hired a, a, a consulting firm that we have a lot of confidence in, and we'll be working as partners with them to rebuild our system to make everybody's life easier who interfaces with US Chess. 
I, I threw this together to kind of illustrate how we as an organization are evolving. So before last year, we were, we had four basic um, operational areas, events, administration, um, membership, and publications. We still have those four. We call publications communications, but that's really the biggest difference. But we've also added a program division and um, our development department. And, you know, this, this represents change and, it, and it's shifting resources within our organization, our staff resources, to um, deliver on the mission that the board and the delegates have set, set us forth on. But the more things change, they also stay the same. We've had a banner year in rated play. So 12,100 plus rated events last year. Last year, I think it was like 11,500. That's a pretty significant increase year over year. In terms of rated um, games, we're up to 845,000 in change from 813, I think, last year. Wow. So again, we are growing in all the ways that this organization has grown over its history. And you know, so for people who are uncomfortable with maybe us shifting some of our emphases, please know that the health of the Federation remains with our, our scholastic and other events that many of you run out in the communities all throughout the country. And to my mind, they are the best demonstration for why chess is a great activity for people of all ages. Of course, we, we spend a lot of time on scholastic events. They are very important to growing the Federation. We had another tremendous year with, with um, our scholastic events. Um, growth in three of the four, the K-12 here in Orlando last year was down about 6%. I, I, I would venture a guess the reason for the, the downslide was that the event was actually a little bit closer to the Christmas holiday last year. And between end of semester exams for some high schools and family commitments and, and, and the like, um, it, it just <coughs> ate into our attendance a little bit. And then we're tracking the number of girls who are participating in our events. And we hit 20% this year at the National Elementary. That's, that's, a, that's a marker for us. That's tremendous growth um, over the time that we've been investing in women's issues. And I think you can just see that the biggest jump from this graph um, is in the National High School. We had a 46% increase in the number of girls year over year who participated in the high school event. That, that was huge. And the other observation I'll, I'll, I'll share is the strength of field at these events is growing every year. We, we had a, a young GM win the National High School this year. And he won on, on tie breaks. So three, it was a three-way tie for the, the top. But this is a GM who's playing in the National High School Scholastic event. That's, that's remarkable. I, I, I hesitated to call this set of activities external because they really are advancing our mission, but our outreach to our state affiliates is, is something where we had fallen down on the job for a number of years. We, we, we lost touch with our, our affiliates, and, and so with Jen, Jen Pearson's efforts over there, she developed a bi-monthly newsletter just sharing information to connect our affiliates back to the mothership. I mean, it's simple, it's communication. And, and you know, we've, we've invited their contributions to, to share with others, and, and we see a lot of opportunity to facilitate more interaction among the state affiliates moving forward, and, and we think that our IT refresh will support that as well. W with support from the U.S. Chess Trust, we've run a number of regional girls and women's events this year. Those have been wildly successful and are expanding this year. Um, Maureen, do you know how many are on tap right now for the coming? Okay, she's working. There's a number, and those can be found on the U.S. Chess um, website under the women's program. One of the, the highlights of my year was working with the um, World Chess Hall of Fame's team to put together the exhibition on U.S. Chess 80 Years, a celebration of this organization. And um, it was really fun going through the dusty files and <laughs> looking for artifacts that told the story of this organization um, throughout its history. And 
You still have time to visit. Um, I think it closes the first week of October. Is that right, Tony? Yeah. yeah. And so it's it's free. Um, the things that are going on there are are just remarkable, and um, I, I commend it to all of you to take a side trip if you have the opportunity. And then finally, we're we're trying to build partnerships outside of our community because we think that chess is can be for everyone, and there's a lot of interest from non-traditional partners. You know, last year we had the Alzheimer's Association here, um, and they conducted a workshop for us. There, there is more and more interest that we see from community groups that um, would like to engage with us, and right now we're limited by our personal bandwidth and time, um, and less so by the financial resources that might be also a limitation. So what's next? Um, building capacity. Uh, you know, this this is tr transformation. Change is you know there's there's no real clear roadmap for this, but we are putting down markers against which we can measure our progress, and it it necessarily requires us to tackle things in in a different way. And I know that's not always easy to internalize, but uh, I think we're we're proceeding at about the right pace, and um, you know, pulling people in where they may have gifts that they weren't necessarily hired for. Pete Kiriannis um, <coughs> being a prime example of that. Pete's our assistant director of events, but he's a great writer and a, a great personality. So he's got one of our four podcasts, for example, and and just allowing people to grow in ways that use the talents that they love to use in addition to what they were hired to do is, I think, a real formula for success for us. Again, building and, and launching programs. I, I would venture a guess I spent about 30% of my past year working on this IT refresh between the RFP and reviewing proposals and talking to vendors. Um, you know, th and that will continue this year as we actually um, start to do the real work of that transition. The governance task force. While they didn't put forward any recommendations this year, I expect next year that we may have a set of recommendations from them, and some of those will be changes that may be hard to accept. But I ask that everybody consider those with an open mind, because as a C3, which is different from a C4 with what we do and how we do it, we have to make some structural changes in the way this organization is run if we are going to have as much success as we hope to have. And, and I would challenge everybody to reimagine what's possible for U.S. chess. What's needed? <coughs> Volunteer talent, people with expertise, um, people who have ideas, creative, creative sorts. Right now we are we are open to lots and lots of ideas, and, and we, we distill them, we work through our committees, our staff works with the board to, to advance exciting excitement and, and new programs for US Chess. We want the engagement to be strategic, and, and some of what the board has been working over the past two years is through the, the charters that they've retroactively issued for most committees, tied that back to things that align with our mission so that we're all proceeding in the same direction. And, and that is really, really important so that we're not working at cross purposes. So again, the, the work of the committees supports the mission of this organization. And I would just again ask that people be open-minded and uh, approach this with the sense of excitement that I feel and be willing to hear out and be flexible to accept the changes that I think are needed to allow us to be the best organization we can be. And I, I feel like I need to end with our mission, which states um, empower people, enrich lives, and enhance communities through chess. That's really what is motivating us, and um, I thank you for your time this morning. So we used to have this guy, 
who was a contractor to us, and he was overseeing magazines and things like that. And we liked that circumstance so much we hired him as the publications director. And then we looked at it and we said, we've made a mistake. Because it's not about publications, it's about a broader communication strategy and the integration of communications in print, online, other forms of electronic communication, etc. So now we have the Senior Director of Strategic Communication, Mr. Dan Lucas, to report. everyone I'm delighted to be here yet again um, when I was stood before you last year uh, it was as head of a brand new department communications we only had formed in June of 2018 so it's a little bit more fun to present to you this year when we have a, a full year record of achievement that we can present to you um, the theme for this Discuss, uh, talk today is just like the reports that have gone before me is about change but that doesn't mean that just like our friend Tevia from Fiddler on the Roof that tradition is not still important to us we still are devoting time energy money resources into those items that have always been important to us which include chess life our flagship publication going back to 1946. Chess Life Kids, our publication for kids under the age of 13. Our tournament programs, uh, these are screenshots from a few recent tournament programs. Uh, we've, we've really spent a lot of time and effort updating these. Our scholastic newsletter, our US chess newsletter, these go to regular members. The delegates call that you use as such a essential workbook at these meetings. The annual report, which I hope at this point you all have in front of you. Our website, and you know, you, you might wonder why would the website be something that we consider something traditional, but you know, surprisingly, this goes back over 20 years at this point. In fact, here's a screenshot of what it looked like 20 years ago this month. So we are continuing to move forward with these. These form the basis of everything else we do, but as a brand new department trying to have new uh, communications outlets, we are using these strengths to build on for the future. And many of you may be, probably remember the ad campaign in the late 80s from General Motors about this is not your father's Oldsmobile. <laughs> and just like that, this is not your parents USCF, and I am specifically using USCF in that context instead of US chess. So what are we doing to build for the future? Increased reliance on social media, such as Facebook. Twitter is especially important. Almost every event we do now, we have somebody doing a Twitter takeover. Working with Jeff Isaac as he gets the development department off the ground, we are creating brand new collateral for him. Uh, the plan giving brochure is, is one of the first items we've done, and then items like the pledge card that are inserted in this annual report. It takes us in surprising new ways. Our friends at St. Louis told us that their 10-year-old U.S. championship trophy no longer had space for the winner's names. And they asked us to, you know, please provide them with a new trophy. Carol Frank, uh, and Frankie Butler, our creative director, and I worked together to create this new championship trophy. Here it is, a picture of it on display at the 80th anniversary exhibition that Carol mentioned at the Hall of Fame. We also at the same time created a U.S. Women's Championship trophy that's based off of the, um, the colors for the U.S. Women's Program. And we also created replica trophies that the winners could take home. And here's a picture of Hikaru and Jennifer happily holding their winner's trophy. I'm sure they're more happy about the trophy than their actual championship, right? <laughs> <laughs> we are making increased reliance on the use of press releases. Uh, these are being sent out on a regular basis whenever we have a national champion identified, uh, whenever we have uh, just any kind of item of importance in 
U.S. chess. We create, uh, insert, these are inserts that were placed in all U.S. chess branded merchandise that U.S. Chess Federation sales uh, offers. We, last year when I talked to you, Cover Stories with Chess Life was a brand new podcast we had started in April. I had told you that we were working on others and now we have our full slate of, uh, of podcasts. One Move at a Time was the second one introduced and in that one I talked to people who are advancing our mission statement. Jennifer Shahadi started <coughs> Ladies Night in which she talks to people doing items of note in women's chess program. Um, and in fact she was, this podcast was just named Best Podcast by the Chess Journals of America. And Chess Underground that our assistant uh, director of events, Pete Karianis, is hosting in which he talks to people that are involved in chess in an unusual way and have an unusual story to tell. Um, we are sending out congratulatory letters to national champions, to new FIDE titleists, whether that be as a player or as an arbiter, just a way to show these people that they are important to us. Carol has made a very distinct effort to keep our events welcoming and in, in that in that vein, she asked us to create a welcome to national uh, um, events guide for people that are brand new to these events where it can be so overwhelming to show up and see thousands of people and not know where chess control is or even what chess control is. And so we created this guide as a downloadable PDF. Um, Ryan Velez, our board member, presented uh, most of the, the text that was used in this and then we did a, did a layout that was available for download and we email blasted it out to participants. Branding continues to be a very high priority for us. This is our primary logo, and it remains the one that we protect with, with uh, probably the most, the most venom. Um, <laughs> but there are reasons to have other types of logos. For example, on, on Facebook, the New York Times, you know, they have their primary logo in black up there, but for different <coughs> sections, they've created variants on that logo. Um, to that, we created a U.S. Chess Women's logo uh, to, to help brand that program, and this one has been particularly well received. Um, U.S. CF Sales immediately created some merchandise for the uh, for the women's program, and my understanding is that at uh, some of the events, this merchandise is even sold out. This is our 80th anniversary year at U.S. Chess, so we created a logo to celebrate that, and we've been using it on the cover of Chess Life and on your delegates' bags, among other places. We created logos for our affiliates to use for their state affiliate and for um, sil our silver and gold affiliates and for people that just want to use it to brand a rated event. These have been popular and well, well received and well used as well. For example, here the Texas Association has put it on their website. The Illinois Chess Association has put it on their website and they even took it a step further and created a uh, brand new state association logo that incorporates the new state affiliate logo, which I thought was a really cool way of doing it. This year we um, self-published the Rules of Chess. It was always um, published by more traditional publishing houses in the past, and so uh, this, this was done. If you haven't seen it, if you haven't received your print copy, it is for sale right now in the bookstore uh, across the way. It's also available as an ebook on Amazon, and the three key chapters were made available for free download on our website. So, that was a lot of new aspects of what we're doing. Uh, we, we were, but it doesn't mean that there isn't still more to do. And so, on the horizon, we have things like we have these old new to chess videos that are on our on our on the old portion of our website and they're a little bit dated already even though they're they're, they're not that old um, you know Jennifer Shahadi has been doing a good job creating new videos for us we have some good ones coming uh, in down the pike and we really want to get more user friendly videos for people that are brand new to chess to learn how to play um, and yeah so I want to talk about how we are putting this all together. This, because we have so many powerful tools at our disposal now, I want to show you an example of a, where we had a very coordinated campaign 
to use all of the resources we have in communications to tell a really compelling story. And last year, uh, Timur Gariev won our US Open. You probably all know he's a very interesting character. We knew we couldn't just do a standard portrait shot uh, for a cover story for him. So Melinda and I contacted Jennifer Valens, who was serving as his manager at the time, and, and she said to us, and hi, Jennifer. <laughs> she said, well, you know, he likes to parachute. And she knew a uh, videographer that could, could uh, work with us. So that seemed like a no-brainer. And so we did, we did hire a videographer who not only had extensive experience filming parachuting, but he actually has won two Emmy Awards for, for his work. So U.S. just hired an Emmy Award winning videographer. This indeed is not your parents U.S. Chess Federation. <laughs> <laughs> I want to show you, uh, the video is only two minutes long. Uh, I don't know that you've all had a chance to see it. If you, if you haven't, it's probably been six months since you have. So let's just take two minutes to look at this exciting video. If you have vertigo, you may want to turn away. <laughs> And unfortunately, we don't have sound connected. There's only music attached to it anyway. If you put your mic on. Yeah, you can put your mic on. <laughs> so, was it a rated game? <laughs> <laughs> they announced they announced the venue in advance, mm -hmm. so <laughs> He made an illegal move. <laughs> <laughs> and Mike Hoffpower also asked up here if it was a rated game. It was intended as such, but we could not find a TD to jump with him. <laughs> <laughs> so what did we do with this fantastic, yeah, uh, sure. Right, and, and, and in fact, he did a number of training jumps. Uh, I believe it was like 12 jumps that he did before they, they got the material they wanted. Uh, flying the board proved difficult, uh, and they had to uh, attach a special cone underneath it to make it more aerodynamic. <laughs> That's a good um, point. So what did we do with this uh, fantastic material? Well, obviously, we put it on our own website on C and made a CLO report out of it. Um, we put it on YouTube. We put it on uh, our Twitter feed. It was uh, put on Facebook, and I sent out a press release to anybody and anyone I could think of. Uh, not obviously, it went out to all, everybody in the chess press, but I sent it to very a great number of mainstream media outlets as well. We did get a number of PR hits. Chess Base ran it. Chess Base India ran it. Who knows how many eyeballs we got on that on that site too. Um, and then in the mainstream press, the U.S. Parachutist Association they found it a very interesting story and they put it on their website. Um, and one of the coolest ones was uh, Cater's news agency in the United Kingdom. They picked up this story and distributed it throughout their whole European network. So we got a lot of bang for the buck. Uh, with this video, and it was a very successful project for us. And so we will, as we go forward, we'll be looking for other ways 
to take these kinds of compelling stories and present them in a, in a cohesive, unified way, instead of kind of the haphazard scapeshot way we've often done it in the past. And I'd like to close by just giving a shout out to the communications department team that makes this happen. Starting on the left side is Jennifer Shahadi, our women's program director, who also still carries the title of senior digital editor. Below her is our newest hire, John Hartman. He uh, was hired in February and served, does the day-to-day -day work on CLO. Next to him is, in the blue top, is Melinda Matthews. She is our publications editor, and under that uh, title is the Chess Life and Chess Life Kids editor. Above her is Frankie Butler, who was promoted this year from art director to creative director. Next to her is Alan Cantor, our copy editor and editorial assistant. Below Alan is Joan Bois, who does the TLAs for us. Next to her is Natasha Roberts, who is, was promoted this year from editorial assistant to creative content coordinator. And under that job role, she does the infographics you see in Chess Life as well as manages the art direction for Just Life Kids magazine. And above her is international master Ron Burnett, who is our technical editor, uh, which means he reviews all the chess and all the magazines before they go to print, and saves our butt when we write that queen b5 is you know, a, a fantastic move in a position when it really just overlooks a mate in one. <laughs> <laughs> so again, it was, it's been great interacting with everybody this week. I appreciate all the feedback I've been getting. Uh, you know, please continue with that in the year to come. And thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Dan. You know, one thing interesting about that team that he posted is how many actually work in the office in Crossville? Like one. There's a couple other people who are nearby, but they don't work out of the office. So we are very spread out. We are a very virtual organization in so many ways. Um, thank you, Dan, for your report. The next what? report. What about yeah. this one? Yeah. She wants it's, it's her. No, she wants you to unplug it. Thank you. Hold on. It goes under. Okay. There you go. Um, I would like to thank you, Dan, and everybody at the Publications Department and Community. Department. Uh, this year, I organized the World Junior Chess Championship for Players with Disabilities. Um, it's the third time that it's being hosted in the United States. Um, one of, I think it was covered in one of the um, press releases that was included in, uh, in the online publication. Then later on, I requested to include it in Chess Life. They told me, no, it's better to just put it in Chess Life for kids, which is fine. Uh, we will do that. But I wanted to give everybody the good news that we're going to, that CNN came to the event, and they spent the whole day filming for something that is called Good Stuff. So in the middle of this month, there's going to be a between three and a half to five minutes report on the tournament in CNN. So I would really appreciate if the Federation promotes this information and they help us through their channels to spread the concept, which I think it helps everybody. It's about children, it's about inclusion, and obviously supporting people with disabilities. Okay. Thank you. Can't help but chuckle. We'd love to promote good stuff, wouldn't we? <laughs> okay, that's our our next report. I don't think Boyd is in the room, is he? So I would turn this over, Frank, to our FIDE zonal president. He would be next. We'll pick up Boyd when we can find him. Um, the zonal president's report is in your delegates call on pages 28 to 31. Now it's not that dense, there's a lot of lists and stuff in there. You probably don't know this guy very well because he's not played very many roles for us in the Federation <laughs> over the years. I think it's his second stint as our zone president. Um, in fact it is, and it's unfortunate uh, that it's his second stint because he um, had or was very willing to step in 
and replace uh, our dear departed Ruth Herring, who had been serving in that position. So as much as I love having Frank do this report, my heart hurts that Ruth cannot. Go ahead there, Frank. Okay, thank you, Alan. Um, and speaking of the roles, uh, Dan, I re just realized why I was never the interim publications director. <laughs> and I could not make fancy charts like you can, so uh, mine are pretty plain. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, just to what Alan just said, um, oh, by the way, one more thing, though, before I start. Uh, I have jumped from airplanes. Back in 1970, I was a young soldier in Fort Benning, Georgia, going through airborne training. And uh, from a much lower altitude, and not using anything fancy, not a chessboard in my hands, I broke my ankle. So uh, I don't know how Timor did it. <laughs> and if they need a TD for a tournament like that, I am not it. <laughs> uh, but in any event, getting serious, uh, I echo what uh, Alan said. It is uh, with, with a great sense of sadness that I uh, stand before you here to deliver this report. I was a sonal president from uh, October 2010 <coughs> until August 2016. Uh, just before that U.S. Open in 2016, Ruth was talking to me, and she asked me, she said, well, when you get tired of this, uh, <laughs> I'd like to be the zonal president. And I said, well, your turn out this year, so why don't we do it right now? So I recommended to the EB that they appoint uh, Ruth as a zonal president, and they did. Uh, so uh, it is with uh, an aching heart that I'm, I stand here again uh, due to her passing. Uh, and once again, I, I was not happy, but I was willing to, to step in uh, and do this again. So the third slide, please, uh, Grant, uh, World Events. Uh, it is well published by now, of course. Uh, about how well we did at the World Olympiad. And again, like Alan said, everything is there on page 28 to 31. Uh, so I'm not gonna read slides to you, um, but uh, just two comments on the Olympiad, and that is that uh, our team, the open team that is, uh, finished in, uh, get the silver medal. They finished tied for first with China, lost some tie breaks, but uh, our team was the defending champion. Uh, it is not easy to defend, especially at that level. So just because we have won the goal before they won the goal, didn't, did not guarantee anything. It was very tough. They finished tied for first, and they got silver. So uh, at that level, all those teams on the top, they're so close to each other that you never know what's gonna happen. So, uh, and then when it's tie breaks, you really don't know what is gonna happen. Uh, and the women, uh, although they finished in seventh place, um, they actually did very well because they were the 10th seed at the Olympia. So they did above their expectation, if you want to count it based on seeding. So uh, next uh, slide, please. Uh, other world events. Um, I think Beatrice just mentioned that uh, 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 they organized the second World Junior Chess Championship back in August last year. Uh, they only had eight players. so. To Beatrice's point, where's Beatrice, by the way? She's over there. Yeah, thank you so much for organizing that event. I think you have brought all three so far to the US. And again next year? We have about 16 players. No, no, I know I know you did, but you have you have brought over the tournament each and every uh, the third time now, and next year will be the fourth. And like she just mentioned, and I have a, a slide later on that talks about briefly talks about this year's event but she went from eight players to 16 players. So uh, again, uh, with her support and the, the support of many, uh, it is getting better. Uh, and our thank to her team and, uh, uh, and Beatrice in particular. Uh, the World Junior and girls uh, under 20, that was a really tough tournament. A lot of grandmasters there. Uh, you may recall that a few years ago, not long ago, uh, our own Grandmaster uh, Jeffrey Zion won it with Aranto Spare. Uh, this, this past year, a wonder who was our top seed uh, finished in 28th place. But it was such a, it was much, much, much stronger than I have ever seen it. Um, and uh, and uh, the World Youth uh, 
under 18, under 16, under 14. I don't think any of our players are medaled. And um, to finish in the top 10, so the names are there. Uh, next slide, please, Brent. Uh, the cadet, however, uh, our players always do very well, and uh, this past year was no exception. And uh, they are highlighted are the players who medaled. Uh, lastly, on that slide, uh, I have the, a brief summary of the Women's World Championship Knockout Tournament. We had two participants, uh, Sabina Foster, she was the 2017 U.S. Champion. And in that number of years, the U.S. Championship doubles as the Sono Championship. Uh, the second place that year was Nasi Paikitsi. However, Nasi was not able to attend. Uh, so the third place finisher, Grandmaster Irina Krush, uh, Irina went. Uh, they both had tough matches. Uh, Sabina tied, or drew, I should say. I'm a chess player. <laughs> they drew uh, the first two games, and then on tie breaks or, or uh, rapid games, then she lost to Antonetta Stefanova from Bulgaria. And Irina lost in the next round to the eventual champion, uh, Grandmaster Ju Wen Jun from China. So they did well, uh, but they got eliminated early, especially Sabina. Uh, other world events, uh, of course, wasn't heard by now of the world championship that took place in London last year. Um, our representative, Fabiano Caruana, did not win, but as we know, he drew all the regular games and then lost on tie breaks. Um, and I, for one, and I know all of us, are hoping that we again have an American uh, player uh, in 2020 to represent the U.S. and also in the, in the, at the world stage in the, the highest tournament that they have. Um, in the World Senior Championship, uh, we had only three players, and they're listed there uh, in the 50-plus, in the and then two players in the 65-plus. Uh, many players there, uh, but uh, we didn't have, uh, we had two women in the 50-plus, but uh, I don't think we had no players in the other. Uh, the next slide was is about the World Team Championship. And uh, it's uh, worth, worth noting there, as, as you can clearly see, that none of our top players were able to participate. That is not to say that they didn't want to, but the scheduling did not. Uh, I believe Tony was in the U.S. Championship shortly after, starting shortly after that. Yeah, so uh, I'm sure many elected to get ready for the U.S. Championship instead. Uh, so uh, uh, only uh, Samuel Sevian uh, won a medal there uh, on his board, board two. Uh, on the next slide, um, uh, I have there the senior team tournament. Uh, and our team, uh, the 50 plus team, successfully defended. Uh, that is uh, two years in a row that our team wins. So congratulations to our team and uh, Hopefully they'll make it three in a row uh, at, at the next one. Uh, there was no team in the 65 plus, uh, nor was there a women's team in either category. So uh, again, here is where I had the third uh, World Junior Chess Championship for the Disabled, uh, Beatrice. And I note here that now you had, this year you had uh, 16 participants that just concluded about three weeks ago. So again, thanks for a job well done there. On the continental and regional events, uh, on the Women's Continental Championship, uh, we only, only have one young lady, Thalia, uh, and she finished 11th. Uh, and then on the North America Junior under 20 in Baja California, uh, we have some players that are listed there. And lastly, uh, we, had, uh, we had a few players in the Pan Am Senior uh, in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh, and the only female in the field was Julie O'Neill uh, from Arizona. Uh, so um, she will be competing, I hope, at the Worlds. Uh, 
uh, point of information? Yes. Uh, yes, Julie actually finished third overall in uh, players age 65 and older. Okay. Uh, as a result of that, actually, she will receive free room and board at this year's World Senior in Bucharest. And if she happens to take somebody with her, they will get half rate on the uh, room and board. I do hope that somebody in the USCF offices will make sure she knows about this. Oh, okay. Well, uh, and uh, Julie's a friend of mine, so I'll, I'll talk to her. And uh, as far as gonna go, somebody going with him, I'm sure Nick Schumacher, her husband, will be there as well. He participated in St. Croix, so uh, that's great. That's good to know. Thank you for adding that. Um, just so that we maybe nip something in the bud, a point of information is asking a question. If you are wanting to make a statement of fact, then don't raise the point of information, and we'll call on you if you're at the microphone when we're ready to do that. So please don't anybody do another point of information and tell us what you think, okay? Ask the question. Go ahead, Bob. Okay, thank you, Alan. Uh, the next slide, uh, the FIDE Americas uh, uh, Continental uh, Regional Tournaments, the North American Junior Under 20, uh, that was held in June. Uh, some of the things uh, are not in uh, pages 20 to 31 because uh, the term is concluded after I wrote the report for publication. Uh, so I don't think this one is. Uh, but as you can see there, uh, this one was uh, organized by, by Grant Owen, right? Uh, and uh, by far, most of the players were from the U.S. Uh, in the Open, there were 50 out of 52 from the U.S. I think there were two from Canada, right? And uh, in, in the girls' championship, as you can see there, out of the 25 participants, 21 were from the U.S. Uh, and of course, you have uh, the list of the ones who won medals. Uh, secondly there, uh, the Continental Championship in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, this, this tournament is very important because the top four finishers qualify for the World Cup. And of course, players want to do that. Uh, but obviously, if they have already qualified by virtue of the US championships, then they have no interest in going to this. Uh, but uh, there you have our Parachutis, Timur Garif, who was our highest finisher from the US <coughs> in eighth place. Uh, lastly there, and uh, I know that uh, Maureen will, I was talking to her earlier, uh, uh, the Pan Am under 20, uh, we had a girl, Annie Wang, playing in the open division, not the girls, and she finished with the gold. So that was amazing. Uh, our congratulations to Annie. Uh, as a result of that finish, Annie Wang gets automatically the IM title. So that is fantastic news. Uh, the next slide. Um, the 2019 U.S. Championships, the only reason I talk about that is because, once again, in odd number of years, it is the zone championship and the zone president. So, uh, and uh, thankfully, uh, thanks to Tony's group, I was also the chief arbiter for that. So, uh, thank you, Tony. Uh, the players listed there, in Cairo, Lanier, Fabiano, Sam, and Jeffrey qualify for the World Cup based on their finish. And in addition to that, Wesley So, had already qualified because he was a semi-finalist at the, at the last World Cup. And Sam Shanklin, speaking of the Continental, because he won the Continental Championship, so he also qualified. And as we all know, uh, on the women's side, uh, they qualified for uh, what used to be the Women's Knockout Tournament, and now it's going to be the Women's World Cup. And that's uh, Jennifer, Jennifer Yu, who won and Tate Abrahamian who finished second on tie breaks. Uh, the next slide on the titles earned. The ones that I have uh, highlighted in red are the ones that are not in the, in the book because those were as a result of the second FIDE presidential board meeting that took place in Baku at the end of uh, June. Uh, so all those players now have earned a title. Titles, the one in asterisk, uh, it is conditional, conditional in rating. They have to attain the rating first. Uh, on the book, I list uh, 
in the middle column there, uh, International uh, Master Ben Lee. Uh, he has an asterisk in where you can read your book, but he has met the title, so he now has, uh, or he has met the rating, I should say, so he now has the title. Uh, and uh, at the next presidential board, uh, that is going to be in uh, Budapest, Hungary, uh, we have so far three applications. Do we have any more grants? No, those three, okay. So uh, for International Master Edward Sun, for Win Grand Master Carissa, and for Fide Arbiter to actually Eric and Jeff. So those have been sent to Fide already, will be considered at, at the next uh, presidential war in September. Now, um, I think Michael Karapaski, are you here? I think he you. is. Oh, hi, Michael. Uh, so uh, I, I stay in close communication with uh, Michael Karakowski, who, in addition to being our FIDA delegate, uh, he is, as we all know, a FIDA vice president, as well as uh, I, I, I'm in contact often, every week, just about, with uh, Mr. Jorge Vega. Uh, he is also, he's the continental president and also in the presidential board, therefore. Uh, and. I'm told by both, I think, and Michael can correct me, but uh, if they're gonna have a, a presidential board meeting in September, which where they are, uh, that means that they're not gonna have a Congress uh, for about three months after that, maybe? They, they could do it sooner, yeah. But, but the point is that there's a chance that the next FIDA Congress uh, maybe in December. And there are even rumors that it may be between Christmas and the year. So uh, how will that affect our attendance there? Uh, that's up to the uh, REB and uh, the office staff and so on to decide. Uh, but it may very well affect the attendance to the next Congress. Uh, uh, back on Ruth, I, uh, I was, uh, I, had, I had the honor to attend five feet of congresses with her and with Michael. Um, it was always so good, you know, sharing the evenings, uh, talking about our report online and things like that. Uh, and uh, we're gonna miss her so much. So again, uh, I humbly submit this report today and um, we'll see what happens next. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you. Yeah, the president's wife's going to be real thrilled if he's in Moscow at Christmas time. <laughs> Sorry, she's here. She hadn't heard that yet. Um, we will have Boy Reed's presentation after lunch because many of us have a, have a heavy lunch day here in just a minute. Now, we will reconvene promptly at 2 o'clock. For those of you all who are not joining us for the awards lunch, those of you who are, we will repair to the location of it. Yeah, usually okay. I have no problem with knowing where I'm supposed to go because many people tell me constantly, some of you all do by email, on the forums, and even the occasional letter. But I don't know where to tell these people to go here. It's, it's in Signature 2, which is where the Executive Board reception was last mm. evening. Out here, up the escalator, left, left, left. Okay, it's right above the bookstore. We will see you all. We are now recessed until 2.